My name is uh, Devna Manolov. I'm going to be the chair uh, for you, the first chair for you in this session. I'm uh, currently a um, uh, Paris region or Novi Curie co fund fellow at the Observatoire de uh, in Paris. I'm a Byzantinist. I'm a historian of science too, which is important for the story because it just proves that a book about uh, the status of Thessaloniki can very easily be read by somebody like me and by many of you as well. Um, before I introduce uh, the author, Bauke van den Berg, and her uh, monograph, I also want to remind you, please, to mute, to mute your microphones, and that we are not going to accept uh, any live questions. So if you have a question or comment, please put it in the Q&A section, or if you are a panelist, in the chat. And then in the, in the second half of this session, when we have 15 minutes of q and I'm going to read those questions for Bucket to answer. Uh, now I'm going to offer a very short introduction to her and uh, her pro research profile and to my personal impressions of the book, after which she will give a 10 minute presentation uh, of her monograph. So Dr. Bauke van den Berg is an associate professor of Byzantine studies at the Department of Medieval Studies at Central European University, currently in Vienna. Um, in her scholarship, Bauke has focused on literature, including poetry, rhetoric, and education. She is known for her uh, work on Homeric studies uh, and the Homeric studies of the Byzantines, which I think is an important point she also uh, tries to make, uh, and especially on authors such as John Tsetsis and Studios of Thessaloniki. In addition to this monograph, which is featured during the festival, she also recently co-edited uh, a volume called Byzantine Commentaries on Asian Greek Texts uh, between the 12th and the 15th centuries. And I had the pleasure to be one of her co-editors together with uh, Przemysław Marciniak. Um, and this is a testament uh, to her, um, you know, to her work and to her discipline that in a year she managed, managed to co-edit a volume and to publish this monograph. So I think uh, many congratulations, Valkia, for doing this. Um, so at the same time, of course, uh, the work never stops. So together with another uh, panelist I see here, uh, uh, Nikos and Glass, they are currently preparing another edited volume, uh, which is focused on Byzantine poetry in the long 12th century. So as you get the uh, impression, there's um, Bauke is a specialist on the 12th century, but not only. And of course, the status of Thessaloniki has been a prominent figure in her scholarship, but again, not only as we shall, uh, as we shall find. Uh, so with this, I uh, move to, to a few personal impressions about the monograph, which we are uh, gathered here today to uh, uh, learn about. The title of the monograph is Homer, the Rhetorician of Statues of Thessaloniki on the Composition of the Iliad. It was published uh, within Oxford Studies in Byzantium uh, series by Oxford University Press last year. Um, so as Bauke herself writes, uh, despite you know, the um, very clearly defined topic already in the title of the book, this is also a book that is supposed to show what it meant to be an educated person in the 12th century, what rhetorical education in the 12th century was, and also what it meant to study Homer again in the 12th century. And by emphasizing this uh, little bit uh, uh, from her introduction, I just want to point out one of the things that I really appreciated about the book, namely the fact that even though it focuses on rhetoric, on literary criticism, on the way of studying Homer in a particular context, it is always very, this work is always very conscious of its historical context, and it's always historicizing and bringing our attention to the fact that we are in a particular time, in a particular place, uh, and also even in a particular school context, uh, if necessary. Um, as I know from Bauke's work in other contexts, she's also very good, uh, very gifted in making very difficult things seem easy. And in this case, that's the reading and the translating of her studies also. Some uh, of you might know how difficult and challenging that is. And I also remember it from one seminar I took with her. Uh, and um, from this point of view, it's really important to emphasize that the book includes uh, three appendices, uh, which feature uh, three different translations uh, into English. Um, and I think that's one of the important, though, uh, additional contributions that this monograph offers to us. Uh, 
Uh, as to the main point, um, even if this is a book about the studies, it's according to me, according to my reading, uh, really a book about the rhetorical education of which he is, of course, a distinguished representative. Um, and if I think about the second chapter of the book, which is titled The Skillful Composition of the Iliad, uh, then I really appreciated that this book uh, in a very accessible way lifts the curtain and offers a very um, understandable view of the 12th century literary criticism and what it meant to try to write and produce such literal criticism. Basically, it shows us, Balki shows us in a very, uh, I think, um, accessible way, what was the craft of writing according to his studies and how did he himself uh, uh, practice it? How did also he analyzed it in terms of Homer and how he developed it further? And then what techniques were judged felicitous and effective uh, by him and by his contemporaries? Um, further, I think, together with Bauke's book, uh, it is very interesting for me to think of, or it was very interesting as I read the book, to think of Homeric poetry in Byzantium as potentially invoking um, ambiguous responses, uh, which then related relate to questions of plausibility and usefulness. I thought that's a very uh, major point for me as a reader, that the uh, Homer in Byzantium in, is not a straightforward uh, statement, that there are nuances, that there are ambiguities, and that there are sometimes even contradictory reactions. And the work of Statius is doing is against this uh, precise background. I also thought that it is philosophically important um, based on what um, the analysis, um, anal Balkis analysis gives us to scrutinize the Homeric plausibility theorized by Eustadius as possible common denominator for both the historical and the mythical narratives that we meet as students of Byzant Byzantine literature may encounter. In other words, when in chapter three, uh, which is entitled The Plausible Composition of the Iliad. So when in this chapter we learn of, um, yes, I think I, I, sorry, I just double checked if I read the right title, I think I did. Um, so when in this chapter we learn of how Eustatius teaches the techniques of persuasive discourse through his reading of the Iliad, we may wish to further think about different types of narratives and their respective claims on a truth about something, on a certain knowledge about something, if that something is the Trojan War or something else, it doesn't really matter for the philosophical exercise I'm proposing. So different types of narratives have different truth claims and how plausibility and techniques to craft that those claims um, are being taught and are being exercised by professional rhetoricians in Byzantium. I think it's a great subject that Bauke touches upon and offers to us. Finally, uh, also in, uh, um, I think also in the same chapter, Balkan makes the reader consider the entanglement of history, poetry, and myth with didacticism and therefore with ethics, which I also thought was a very major point. And I appreciated very much her discussion of how Statius uses uh, allegory in relation on the one hand, to storytelling and plausibility, which is something I expected uh, to read about, but then the more unexpected part for me in relation to moral and truth claims of Homer's nar narrative. Um, and as a case study for the status of literary criticism, of course, and finally, as a, an example of his rhetorical teaching, and importantly, allegory as an opportunity for the author's self-referentiality. Uh, I think that point comes you know, later in the book, but I think it's also very important. Um, and also a productive thing that I hope to see uh, more in further scholarship by Bauke and others. So uh, with this, I stop. I think I'm on time. And uh, I pass the word to Bauke van den Berg to introduce her monograph. Thank you very much. And uh, let me share my screen, even though the slides are insubstantial, but um, it will help me. Um, so thank you very much, Divna. Um, the book um, that we're talking about is the revised version of my doctoral dissertation, which I defended at the University of Amsterdam in 2016. Um, in many ways, the book is about Eustathios and his reading of the Iliad, but more than that, as Divna already stressed, 
uh, it explores reflections on authorship and good literature by one of the most celebrated orators and teachers of rhetoric of the 12th century. Um, Evstatis was presumably born in Constantinople around 1115, where he completed his education and held various posts in the ecclesiastical ecclesiastical bureaucracy. He was also active as a teacher of grammar and rhetoric and in the course of his career made his way up to the position of master of rhetoricians and official court orator under Emperor Manuel I Cominos. He was later appointed Archbishop of Thessaloniki, uh, a position that he held until his death in uh, around 1195. Um, he was depicted as a saint as early as the 14th century, as you can see here in this fresco from Mount Athos. It is generally assumed that Eustathius produced most of his scholarship on ancient poetry during his time in the capital, even if he continued to expand the Homeric commentaries also after he had moved to Thessaloniki. And you can see the four big volumes of the modern edition of the commentary on the Iliad by Marquinhos van der Valk on the screen. My study of this immense text starts from the premise that Byzantine commentaries on ancient literature are firmly grounded in their social, cultural, and intellectual contexts. Even though they focus on texts written centuries ago and draw on sources dating to long before their time, commentaries such as those of Eustathios on the Iliad and the Odyssey answer contemporary questions of meaning and serve the needs of contemporary audiences. Eustathios was a professor of rhetoric and his commentaries aim to teach everything needed for his readers to become good readers and prose writers, which also justified the importance encyclopedic scope of the commentaries because in Evstathios' view it is polymathy that feeds the art of writing. For Evstathios, Homer is the source of many different kinds of knowledge and a skillful rhetorician whose poems are masterpieces of rhetorical composition. Throughout the commentaries, Evstathios analyzes how the poet composed these masterpieces by pointing to figures of speech and types of style, by scrutinizing the, Homeric, uh, the speeches of Homer's heroes in rhetorical terms, and by exploring the rhetorical principles underlying the successful composition of the Iliad, and also of the Odyssey. Um, in this way, by reading Homer as a prime example, uh, as a prime model for the contemporary reader, Evstathios offers, in the form of his commentaries, an extensive definition of rhetorical aesthetics. A key aim of my research has therefore been to analyze the rhetorical program of the commentaries and to examine how Evstathios defines the rhetorical excellence of the Iliad to gain insight into the ideas on the on excellent oratory of one of the key figures on the intellectual scene of the time. Um, so on the screen you can see the table of contents of the book and Divna already took you through it. Um, the first chapter explores Evstathios' hermeneutic program as it emerges from the preface to the commentary on the Iliad. This program sets the stage for his rhetorical analysis of the Iliad throughout the commentary, which is the subject of chapters two to four. Chapters two and three are devoted to two notions that for Evstathios are at the core of rhetorical virtuosity, uh, namely skillfulness or the notice, and pithanotis, persuasiveness or plausibility. The second chapter, therefore, explores what principles and techniques, um, in Evstathius' view, underlie the composition of the Iliad and define its rhetorical excellence. The third chapter addresses the questions of what for Evstathius it means for a composition to be persuasive and plausible, and what techniques he identifies as underpinning the plausibility of Homeric composition. The final chapter concentrates on Evstathios's interpretation of the Homeric gods as vehicles of fiction and as versatile literary devices in the hands of the poet. Um, and I've added, as Divna said, three appendices with translations of the preface to the commentary of the Iliad and of extensive passages in which Evstathios explains his general ideas on Homeric similes and on muse invocations. Um, in an attempt to make of Sathius's sometimes unwieldy exegesis a bit more um, accessible. If Sathius appropriates notions from ancient grammar, rhetoric, and literary criticism as tools for his analysis of ancient poetry, these notions belong to traditions that, despite their ancient roots, continue to shape the conceptual framework of Byzantine linguistic and literary education and scholarship. 
So my approach has been to see these traditions and earlier texts, not as of Stathios' sources in the strictest sense of the word, but rather as forming of Stathios' conceptual framework. This means that I view earlier material absorbed into the commentaries as germane to of Stathios' reading of the ancient poets. The rhetorical theory of the second century rhetorician Hermogenes of Tarsus takes a prominent place in Evstathios' conceptual framework because Hermogenes' works were at the core of Byzantine rhetorical uh, education and profoundly shaped Byzantine rhetorical thinking. So by using Hermogenes' work, Evstathios analyzes Homer in terms that are directly relevant to Byzantine rhetorical culture. He merges the cultural authority of Homer with the rhetorical authority of Hermogenes and makes Homeric poetry an illustration of Hermogenean theory for the sake of Byzantine readers. And the same goes for the other texts from which Eustathius draws for his analysis. They belong to a synchronic library of technical works shaping 12th century literary thought. The book is the end of a trajectory, but I hope it will also form the starting point for future research. Recent work has shown how fruitful it is to read Evstathius' rhetorical output in dialogue with his scholarly work. Evstathius repeatedly identifies rhetors and prose writers as the intended beneficiaries of his Homeric project. And indeed, his own rhetorical practice seems to have benefited from the ever-growing reservoir of material that are the commentaries, ready to be consulted whenever he was working on one of his orations, sermons, letters, and so on. If we assume that Eustathius' analysis of Homer reflects contemporary rhetorical concerns, as I believe we should do, his scholarly work becomes a treasure trove of reflections on rhetoric, literature, and language that may shed light on the stylistic and compositional underpinnings of his own writings, as well as those of his students and contemporaries. All readers wish for their works to demonstrate their skillfulness and to be paradigms of plausibility and persuasiveness, and Evstathius offers them the tool for making them so. Evstathius' rhetorical program accounts for only one, albeit significant, part of his Homeric exegesis. A comprehensive study of the material other than the rhetorical and grammatical can further flesh out what it means to be a polymath in the 12th century. Um, all of this is just to say that there is still a lot of exciting work to be done, and I hope that, if nothing else, my book stimulates an interest in Evstathios and his work, as well as in Byzantine scholarship more broadly. I would like to thank everyone who has helped me bring this project to successful completion, and I thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you.